talk on genomic functions and techniques in genetics. So basically, we NIBMG is one of the premier institutes in limelight from a couple of, uh, I think, one to two years more uh, aggressively because uh, it has an INSA fault where um, the COVID sequencing has been extensively done and uh, most of the variants in the country has been characterized here. So uh, today I would like to deliver my talk with uh, giving some insights on how the genetic uh, functionalities can be modulated and can be used as an application tool and then different ways of uh, approaches so that that helps us to facilitate it uh, getting uh, understanding very more of the uh, things actually so in brief i would like to know that as i as you are on the lectures and fdp program i i think uh, everyone knows the different classification of uh, branches modern branches of uh, genetics uh, so we stated it could be like a physiological genetics or uh, biochemical genetics or metagenomics where this is the class where that people have interest in looking at different branches of uh, human genetics or plant genetics microbial epigenetics and few more added, added to things but these are more prominent because of the association as an evolutionary thing so we try to basically look at this area and couple of things which will be touching with all these components also for today. So as I said that uh, the physiological genetics can be classified with the molecular genetics and then human genetics also can be taken into that because of the physiology and other uh, important uh, functionalities of the humans. Then we will be looking at uh, the clinical genetics and the implantation genetics and we will just touch these things. And as you know that everyone knows very uh, briefly the of cytogenetics where you look at the chromosome level and different things, especially the aberrations can lead to diseases and other things. And, and again, microbial things plays a very key role. It could be microbes, vir virus, or any other components relating to that which can impact on the different functionalities. For example, instance, a small, tiny viral component had uh, had a big cryos over the globe, not only uh, uh, different countries had to take a very larger step to look into investment for the disease biology. And of course, epigenetics, we all know that uh, the change in the evolution of the genetics can happen at the over a time period and then modulate the things. Uh, of course, uh, metagenomics also I will be touching one part because this is, has taken a very key role now because metagenomics are looking at the big data or big informatics to analyze as an area to look at this uh, huge data of uh, uh, genes and other sequencing. So in that lines, we will be looking at the population genetics, conservative genetics and quantitative genetics. This is a very well known uh, area which we will not be talking today. Anyway. So as you know that there, these are the brief applications what I have mentioned here. And, and the list keeps on adding, adding, but we have tried to give given the best of the things which can be taken. For example, for any diseases or any kind of mutations or any kind of uh, microbial identification and characterization and any inheritance patterns and different plant species. And GMOs take a big role because we know that BT cotton, BT gingol, tomato and other plants also take the GMO products are also increasing in demand because of the climatic conditions and other different uh, modularities for the uh, scarcity of the food and other things. So again, creating GMOs is also a bigger challenges than looking at the stress and drought conditions. Again, fingerprinting, we'll be touching a little bit on this fingerprinting area. It will be called modern biology of forensic sciences. And again, antibiotic resistance, you all know that most of the AMRs, antimicrobial resistant products are getting into the picture now and this drug discovery also may becomes a very big, my lab also works on lung disorders, COPD and different biofilms we target by using the peptides and AMRs also. Genetic can be an medicine, genetic engineering, you all know, you would have studied the and you would have taught the recombinant DNA technologies, crop improvement, animal breeding programs, and again diseases. And the bigger thing is now the vaccine biology, where the 
upcoming vaccines have been coming. So again, going to a little bit of more brief points that uh, tools and applications. Of course, uh, every uh, concept what we talk will have in pro and cons, and especially here in this uh, when we use this uh, genetic engineering, you know that we can have uh, foster for many herbicide disease resistant crops or improve the quality of plants and the bigger and larger fruits, vegetables, and again, it could be for the meat, animal, and again, you can uh, uh, put in your efforts on hooking, making your production of different hormones, insulin, and multiple products. Other side of the coin, same way you have different things where you never know the reaction of the body or the response of the body to the new components. We never know. And again, different Organisms usually be identical and then it can be a limitation for becoming a small gene pool. And again, organisms can go into the different wild or effective populations. We never know. These are the, again brief key points relating to the topic which I have been put for the course and the points of these. And then moving into the next part, as we all know that we are more, more fascinating and now everyone falls after COVID. RT-PCR, RT-PCR. They never, never know the, only few people have the idea of uh, definitions and the applications, but the RT-PCR also, the term has taken into a big uh, buzz around. So, as you know that uh, we all are uh, excited as start, when we start the career of uh, biology or any molecular biology, we speak about uh, polymerase chain reactions. Again, as I said, the real-time PCRs. Looking at different DNA markers, looking at DNA sequencing, and then the big thing comes is the gene editing, where you have CRISPR Cas technology, talent, and gene fingers. I will be just touching today from the, as I'm looking at the time consensus of the CRISPR Cas9 technology and the applications, and then the gene therapy, and microarray, as you know, the DNA micro gene microarray, RNA hybridization is the basic concept, but the microarray and also has a bigger role to play into the genetic tools of uh, modern days. And then you have karyotyping, where you have an extensive look at the chromosome elaborations and different concepts. Again, the advanced is the fish, what we use, fluorescent in, in situ hybridizations, where you want to really look at the uh, binding of the RNA and the other complexities in looking at the cancer and different diseases. And then again, restriction digestion, where Everyone would have known that this is a molecular scissor or it has different things for using for the cloning, which I will be touching today a few of these things. So as a whole, I, at the end of the talk, I would like to convince you saying that the modern application cannot be limiting to one portion, but it has a multi-facet things like that. You, uh, you have to apply the biology, you have to know the biochemistry of the functionalities, and you have to know the biostatics to calculate and then look at the power values and look at the proteomics levels and then look, use your computer systems or IT to make sure that you know about the bioinformatics and then these all components can be used for your wider genomic level uh, validation and on a whole to look at the genetics. So, the modern sciences is evolving such that a person is not restricted to one area, but multi-aerial applications have been used in this uh, uh, arena where you try to put the efforts to make sure that the issues have been solved. So just again, take you a very brief interesting things. Everyone would have looked at the clefts. It's a simple thing, but it has a concept behind it. For example, in the here in the left side, you see that the cleft chin has CC and C and smalls, whereas the uncliffed chin has CC. So, when you see this, it is a very interesting thing because uh, among four, one has a probability or two, kind of one mostly where you have the dominance of the allele, where you have that can be held, uh, to, the, uh, to show that this MS, this person is a probable person, but of getting a chin cleft or any dimple or any kind of body changes. The same can be applied to 
air color and, and and many things of the body's thing but this is just i thought to show you an example before behind the cleft chin also same way when you you can see that uh, the eyelids also has a different thing so for looking at the uh, brown green and blue so when this states also that the bay one see when it is in a dominant allele it could be really coming most of probably to the brown then if it is in recessive then it may be having a blue same way b b2 also represents same thing but when g g y g gene has more dominant allele it can lead to a greenish color to the blue so the order of dominance can be brown to green green to blue so same thing as i'm just showing here an example to show you say that the polygenetic inheritance also can occur for the gene depending upon the uh, allele's thing whether it is the dominance or it is the recessive stage for example this can be applicable for cleft upper chin it could be nose of the peak or as i said dimples or brown black hair or a blonde blonde hair here these are the differences where it shows clearly depending upon the dominance of the gene to the recessive it can be blue or gray and again finally it could be the free ear lobe or an attached ear so the inheritance can be not only at a single level but it could polygenetic same way we just move on from the human examples to the plant genes because i know that uh, the fdb has different programs like different combos of uh, probably different uh, microbiotic molecule and uh, and other classes so i just made sure that each area is touched to make sure that the genetic application can be understandable and it can be more exciting and to hear from to the all section of the people to the start so as i said that uh, transgenic plants expresses bt toxins and uh, these are uh, uh, very well known and characterized now they are genetically engineered to produce the toxin bacillus thuringiensis is spore where it forms through the bacteria that produces the crystal proteins or the cry proteins what we call which are mainly toxic to the insects and the goal is to make sure that the plant is protected from the pests so here the thuringiensis the crop is infected by european corn borer where you see that so this application is made sure that the bt gene is inserted into the crop so that then the pests attack the crop then when they are fed with little bit so then they are more they are toxic for the spray protein and then the plant is protected so that the application i know little bit ponds pink bomb and other things would have come in recent years but still these are just try to adjust address these uh, ponds how to make sure that the plant is protected to and then the vigority and the viability is also enhanced so for example it could be for the bt cotton bt corn or bt brinjal you can clearly see that here the star stunted growth of the larva due to uh, bt toxin but still here the ex excessive damage has occurred because of the larva attacks on this and voracious feeding that this is a clear indication showing that the plant can be protected and this is the example for the transgenic to the control the same way here i have i have given you few examples uh, where you can see that uh, the cry one may be for ball worms uh, for cotton corn would be the european corn borer can be this thing and for potato it could be cry three and for tomato it could be food borer and for brinjal it could be like a target pest these are the couple of uh, examples to to show that uh, how can uh, these crops and the gene targets can uh, target the specific pests and protect the plants same way one more exciting thing here is uh, everyone would have noticed the fluorescence or bioluminescence so there is a small funda into that also like a phenomenon of this production of light by an organism it can be in the creatures of unicellular bacteria to the vertebrates where the chemical energy is converted into the light so mostly this bioluminescence is seen into the marine uh, things but very few terrestrial example it could be firefly or things so the process is 100% efficient and i think uh, people try to manipulate uh, uh, using sorry, uh, people try to manipulate uh, using this system uh, where uh, 
they, they have generated reporter as a systems where they have seen that Renilla Lucifer gene can be used and this can be used as a kind of an uh, experimental based manipulating the system of bioluminescence and fluorescence. I think uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, dental applications uh, for the plagues and other uh, microbials, people start to use this Lucifer system. Again, this is a typical example to show that how you can uh, modulate from the nature of the component can be used. Again, uh, on the same lines, this, uh, you can also talk about GFP, G green fluorescence protein, which has been taken up from the one marine system, where it is a key protein where people use to, in most of the cloning process, are tags so that uh, the expression levels can be visualized under the uh, microscope uh, uh, for the higher end microscope using looking at uh, green fluorescent, red fluorescent, or uh, uh, any other uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, fluorescent emitting things. Same way, uh, here I am giving you the uh, human disease biology network. Uh, so it can, these are the right side, you have a class of diseases from, starts from the bone to cardiac, cancer, to hematology, immunology, ophthalmology, renal, skeletal. It's a big list actually. Again, if you see that this looks, is a human disease network has different signaling modes and expressive levels or activators, inhibitors, repressors, even multiple zones where you need to have a complete study of looking at this network and then deciphering the positives or variants of the phenotypes and then look at the progression of the disease and then come to a conclusion to make sure that you have a specific target so that the, it helps in looking at the specific target as I showed you earlier for a gene and the crop and the pest. Same thing here, it can be like different classification of the disease and then the phenotype characterization and what are the different events and what are the different uh, characters uh, functionalities of the disease and then look at the targets and especially the gene therapies and the personalized medicines gets a bigger play role for different uh, as you know that the part is one of the therapy people manipulate with T cells and then look at for the cancer and then different uh, uh, for diabetics also people try to modulate the uh, stem cell uh, modulations for looking at the pancreatic uh, levels for uh, enhancing the isolate pancreas uh, pancreatic cells to make sure that the insulin composition is being reviewed. So these are, there are multiple examples to define how these can be taken. This is just uh, for your brief understanding, I had made a research study model template aware of what I was talking now. That the first component will be always that you look at the identify the mutations. For example, here I have shown for our because our lab works on COPD and retinal degenerations. We have shown that you have to identify the mutation, then look at the in-depth genetic analysis where this is today's topic of interest, where you use multiple tools. It can be PCR, it can be gene sequencing, it can be a microarray or use CRISPR-Cas9 technology and then do a cloning. What else? Like you, you, Depending upon the question and depending upon the mutation, what you do, you look at the different genetic analysis. Just for your interest, I have just at the next corners will be in the kind of a dotted lines where we, we show that the and disease progression again, you do a mining there, validate the alleles, disease variants, the pathways, and it can be applicable for same things, it can be for your plants also where you look at the different QTLs and then look at the different, uh, it can be for the microbes also because you do a 16S RNA to look at the novel uh, uh, microbes and then you characterize. That's where you will look at the progression of that. Then of course, you use different biochemical, molecular, cellular, again, genomics also, you will single the cell genomics too and look at the different levels. Then you look at the functional studies where you need to understand that how this identified gene and progressive 
variant or any kind of phenotype can impact the protein function. We all know this in Darwin, DNA to RNA to protein. So you know that how these events can be modulated at the DNA level, RNA level, and protein level and impact that. So you use proteomics or you use it transcriptomics or again you use the new area, very new area is the immunoinformatics. Then you do a metagenome analysis and look at the mechanistic and functional analysis. Finally, the prognosis on what we call disease regulation can be evaluated looking at the specific target of the gene of interest or any modulations in the protein, enzyme or any other modality which can be a positive for that. You use in vitro cell line or you use zebra fish, mice, guinea pig, or different kinds of higher animal models. And then now a modern thing, what we do is we use a patient specific stem cell models or a 3D organized models enhanced because mimic most of the times you don't get arguments as such because you mimic the same almost 90%. Uh, physiological concept as in the lab and then you look for these things and they again modern aspects can be congenital origins because due to birth or rare disorders or consanguineous so because uh, in south india and some parts we have this um, you know um, marriages occurring in the relate relatives where it can lead to a genetic implications so as i said that this is a broad template applications what our lab works from a couple of years or we have established with different students working. So we work on retinal biology, lung biology. We look at the genetic based and infectious models and then look at the modulating or the immunoinformatics and then translational application because we believe that from uh, it should be like a from bench to bed that some uh, thing can be helpful to the society. So it can be like targeting using any drugs or a stem cell production. So one little bit again, as I said that the analysis of system, this is this systemic analysis what I've been showing here. You look at the genome level, analyze the expression levels and then you can look at the or the better levels. So it is an integrative information of transcriptome, proteome and the metabolomes, how to determine the biological function. So when I said that, Functional genome plays a key role. So this is also one part of the study where major research occurs. See, when I talk about functional things, you characterize the structure, function, regulation of all the genes and the single genome, gene of the genome and dynamic aspects where you look at the gene transcription, translation or protein studies. Same way, it can it aims to look at the complex relation between the genotype and phenotype. I, I am sure that everyone knows the terminologies uh, because of the time concerns, we can't go into the depths, but still, as I said, the genotype to the phenotype and to the genome levels. So we understand that where do they express, when do they express, and how do they express. Because this also makes, makes a key role because when there is a mutation, then the missionary starts to act based upon the mutation or to the next levels or impaired or activated. You never know. Every time people talk about knockout, knockout, but knock in we also can add because we all, we all would have studied the DNA repair mechanism. So when these are impacted, there can be an addition, there can be a substitution or there can be deletion. So this level of different gene expression at subtypes, cell levels, Expression, regulation, the interaction makes a key things to look at the onset of different conditions. For example, here I have showed the onset of the condition can be disease of different uh, models or the cellular process. So, to move on, uh, as I said, that I had again just make sure that this is a classic and a novel applications where I am showing for the plant also. See, for example, the analytical method, we all know that you look at the quantitative rate or a low side, you look at the PTL and then you look for GWAS, genome wide association studies, and then you will associate with the class. 
then you move on. Here it can be a plant material or a biological material or any material depending upon how you correlate your study. So you look at the mapping of the population, then you look at the diversity of the collection things or the natural. Then you come to a phenotype where you look at the morphological things. That means you see the characters, what all can be at the visual level or looking at the biochemical. Biochemical parameters can be at the enzyme level or any other markers of the biochemical reactions. And then you also do a hydrophobic. Well, here, by doing a mass spec or a individual electrophoresis to characterize the people. Then you look at the genetic, genetic analytical level where you look at the sequencing. So, again, said that standard sequencing is a very well known method, but still the modern applications. I will be showing a couple of uh, sequencing methods also what we will be using. And then now the bigger bus is the next generation sequencing where you get a larger data at this very smaller time but a very qualitative data and then you look at the variations observed for example with the genome sequence will address the mutations additions or whatever the things and you look at the sequence and the expression levels by doing some characterization then you also make sure in this process you get some kind of an indication of the markers for example SNP single nucleotide polymorphism or any other polymorphic characteristics you look at the expression markers and you decide that whether these markers can be a tool also for multiple things. For example, uh, for, uh, for uh, it, it can be a substrate breakdown of a product, or it can be a GFP tag, whatever your marker can be designed accordingly. Then you do a mapping where you look at the resolution levels, whether how it can be correlating with the population level. So at the end of the day, here it's an example to show that how you assist for a breeding and then you get the peak and efficient SNP detection and you look at the complex trait analysis. Finally, you make sure these uh, you know, markers of for the again identified genetic controls can be useful for the breeding and other things. So again, starting to the technologies what about common and DNA technologies are very well known. As I as I said that, uh, for example, the construction of uh, hybrid uh, DNA DNA molecules in molecule in vitro, then the target gene or DNA fragment of interest with along with the vector where the vectors are with a plasmid or a phase or a virus which carries the gene of interest. Then you introduce these uh, DNA molecules into the host. The host cell can be a bacteria, yeast, animal, or any other human cell. Replicate the hybrid molecule and then allow the expression of gene of interest to produce a human protein. So this is a brief of uh, gene cloning, what we know that. And what are the five basic steps you make sure uh, you follow during the gene cloning? You first choose the appropriate DNA to be cloned be the genomic or a cDNA, you make a cDNA library, then you produce a collection of DNA fragments of size suitable for inserting into the appropriate vector. So again, you choose an appropriate vector because depending upon the size and the gene of interest, then you insert the DNA fragments into the vector using a ligase, DNA ligation. Again, you all know that uh, joining DNA ligation is nothing but a joining of this. Then you introduce the fragment to the population of bacteria where you do a transformation. I'm sure everyone would have known the blue white colonies where you, you select the colony based upon desired library and then you give for a sequencing to make sure that the, the clone of interest is in the vector, then your clone is ready for the next steps. So what techniques we use? You need a different plasmids, transformation of plasmids. Again, you need a uh, for cutting the DNA specific sequence, you need a restriction enzyme cut called sites of restriction modification or we call a molecular sequence. You have to remember that this is a novel winning research. And then you do a molecular cloning where you, you put your foreign DNA into the vector and then you generate a DNA molecule, again a novel. And then determination of a DNA sequence, this is also a novel 
synthesis of DNA strand of predetermined sequencing, and then you do a polymerase chain reaction, amplify any specific DNA fragment or a DNA novel. You see that within the genetic engineering tools, you have four Nobel prizes awarded for the research here. So this is just for your information, and you can go into the details of who had one and what was the uh, discovery and other things. So when I talk about the cloning vectors, you target the gene selection and acquisition, then you look at the restriction endonucleases and look at the PCR to a ligation, and then you get transformation and then you do a selection. So the clone identification sequencing, sorry, identification and screening along with the restriction digestion analysis, use a thermocycler DNA sequencing, make sure that the uh, clone of interest is there and then you make a library of construction analysis again you use multiple approaches shotgun or again a good uh, way of thing make electroporation methods for using sure that uh, uh, the cell takes up that and then do sequence for the genome this is a brief report recombinant dna technologies here you use the uh, you, you make sure that cloning is done in a different modalities for example for the human mammalian cells you do a transfection not transformation where it is bind with a lipid moiety and then your gene of interest is made sure that it goes into the human uh, mammalian cell where you look for the further studies again if there is a fine difference in this again the selection goes with uh, based upon the antibiotic uh, thing what you are using again the technology can be applied such a way that you want to convey here that the recombinant DNA tool can be used for both bacterial system and the mammalian system based upon the interest and based upon the clone size and what you want to clone and for the different purposes of the research again these are the Everyone has a. I I I hope that uh, you all will again refresh yourself with the uh, PCR component. You need a DNA sample, and then you need a forward and a reverse primer, and then you need a nucleotide, and then you need an enzyme along with a buffer with MGCL2 and then EDTA, NACL, and other components to maintain the uh, DNA content uh, thing, and then you have you need proper uh, PCR. It can be based upon the interest what you are using. So these are the basic uh, ingredients of the components where you need. And we all know that uh, first there is a denaturing, and then there is an underling, and then there is extinction, and then there is an amplification. Again, we all know that this is based upon the TM values what you use. You use higher uh, temperatures to separate it, and then you look at an appropriate thing where there is a primer binding, reverse and uh, forward and reverse, and then. You look at the different cycles, for example, now RT-PCR for this COVID is very well known that if you have a very lesser count, that means your prevalence of bacteria is more, depends upon the cycles, they decipher whether you are positive or negative based is a qualitative, qualitative RT-PCR, what they say. Again, as I said that uh, you have QPCR, real-time quantitative polymerase chain reactions or you have reverse transcriptase based upon the enzyme, RT polymerase chain reactions, and you have QPCR and RT-PCR combined thing, which have been also one of the prominent things for the SARS-CoV-19. I have given a big list of uh, um, PCR types based upon your interest and based upon the, uh, uh, the need and um, demand of the study. People use different, for example, well known is now real time one, nested one, again, touchdown. People use again different, different um, uh, applications where they use. So, this is a very well known technique or one of the genetic technique which to understand the uh, gene of interest and the functionalities. So, again, moving on, this, as you know, that uh, this is a chain of um, sequencing technology what we have been talking because i started with the sankers method then uh, people started looking at uh, different uh, mitochondrial sequencing and then people started to look at 
sequence, complete cell genome, complete eukaryotic things. Again, the genome, a human genome project, and then the second generation of sequences had come. Now again, meeting at the micro microbiome projects, and then third generations have come, packed bio, and now mostly nano space sequencing, very small thing, and then the next generation sequencing with a complete uh, network where you can look at the uh, complete human sequencing can be studied. This is just to give you the arena of how it had evolved, the costs and how the costs have become lesser as the technology grows and the application increases. So again, this is a genome-wide association study flowchart where you have an identified, we call, we call GWAS, identification of the target population, then there is a sample collection, and then you look for the different sequence. Very clearly uh, deficited here, you get a kind of an uh, electrograms or a mix where you clearly see that uh, there is a mutated disease and then there is a mutation means you see that uh, there is a missing in this So again you compare with the controls and then this is what we call it as a data QC qualitative controls then you look at the imputations uh, where you see that any kind of an SMPs or any kind of an clusters with the nearest neighbors or any bystanders then you make sure that you generate the analysis for this theoretically and then complete it with a functional data. So this clearly shows that from a population identification, you make a blueprint of what is happening by doing multiple studies by using the say, information technology or a bioinformatic technology, which I'll be speaking of in the next couple of slides where you manipulate and then you make sure that there is a database where you go back and then check for the thing. So this is a flow chart what I have briefly shown that how you can manipulate the functional studies. Again, it will be the same thing for whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing process. So with the laboratory, the genome of organism is studied by making a fingerprint of that. For example, here, we take a bacterial cell plate where you again uh, isolate the DNA and it is purified and then the DNA shearing is done basically using the molecular scissors and then you use a PCR and then you generate a library. Then this library is again made sure that it has been uh, each dual fragment have that and there is a readout where you use for a sequencing whole genome DNA sequencing analysis is done then you get a DNA reads. So here the sequencer will produce millions of reads and uh, again you use a specific uh, computer program to make sure that uh, this can be read from first to last and uh, all the single nucleotide is being analyzed and then you make a functional data. So here it is brief, I'm briefly showing that from using a plate to you make a functional study where you isolate you from a DNA then you get a whole genome sequencing process. So this is how you manipulate the study and then make sure that you get the readout from it. Again, moving on, as I said that uh, initially that there are different types of uh, arrays, microarrays, where you use protein array to look at the protein expression and interaction profiling, or take an issue and then get histological sections from that and it could be from the patients or from the thing, or from the controls. And then from the slides, then you make a tissue array by, by isolating RNA. Then you look at the RNA levels. For example, a well-known characterized is colorectal cancer, where people use this uh, microarray as a big tool to identify the cancer. Cellular things, again, reverse transcriptions and other different uh, study cell responses, antibodies, again, as you know that people use a specific uh, thing for an antigen-antibody reaction and then look at the um, expression level. Most of the diagnostic tools here, for example, COVID also had that based upon the uh, simpler test was an antibody test, but still it's a, just a primary indication of any infections. And people use a DNA array where they measure the gene activity and the genotyping also. 
Additionally, you have a chemical compound microarrays, carbon arrays, field arrays. Especially, we are more interested to look at the DNA microarrays of interest to the talk today. You monitor the gene expression, you study the regulatory networks, and then you look at the functionalities of the um, phenotype by looking at the diagnostic tick, and finally looking at the drug mechanism of action also, how it can impact the array. So again, people use genomic DNA hybridizations also, by comparing the microbial diversity, looking at the gene comparison with the evolution and then the binding sites. Again, as I said, that probably a tool for again for the tumor and other disorders. So what you do, so just a, again, briefing you the overview where microarray experiments are done using a specific source of sample, as I said, for example, an RNA or any kind of a DNA or anything, then you look at for RNA, you make a spots kind of a thing, then you look for the image analysis, then you normalize, and then you make a classification of samples. Again, how do you normalize that? Looking at the inferences and the expression level of the same specific significant gene, what you are looking, and then you cluster with the co-expressed genes also. Then you list that, what are the co-expressed genes along with the normal genes, and then look at the promoter analysis and the gene functionalities, and then you predict a pathway where it can say that, okay, this can be a variant where it can be dysregulated and causing a disease. That's how you do a microarray with along with the data analysis has been shown here. Again, there is a broader class where people can look at the making and profiling tool for here or comparative genomics or looking at the disease diagnosis or at the discovery, for example, again for the toxicology. These are the again couple of examples where I have shown you that how can you use the microarray applications. Again, just moving on to as I was, uh, I, I told you that we will be talking about the CRISPR-9, CRISPR-Cas9, which is the high buzz now we will use in <coughs> And different applications. For example, here I am showing you a conventional breeding of a kind of a tomato where you have a kind of a normal one and a cross breed one, and then it can be impacting with uh, mutagenesis, chemicals, or any other radiations. And then you have you still make sure that the allied variety is being selected, and then the desirable variant traits can be taken up, and then you go for the next level of protoplast fusion or any other methodologies to make sure that the uh, breed whatever the yield is enhanced and the disease. So again moving on to one more technology is gene modification where people apply the transgenesis and then they look at the different uh, making up a genetically modified uh, thing like for example here they use a transgenic application or cisgenesis, intragenesis, and then they generate a yield of a tomato. Now the new technology comes is people apply CRISPR-Cas and then do a genome editing study to make sure that the yield is more, the vigor is more, and the quality is more. In uh, the big debate of pros and cons always there, but still this is the comparison of what you start from a conventional reading to a genomic edit. To just detail a little bit more, this is known as a natural and engineered CRISPR-Cas system. For example, here, a natural CRISPR-Cas where you have a bacterial chromosome and you have a chromosome CRISPR loci, where, for example, here, the transcription of free CRRNA and PACER RNA here, the binding of tracer RNA to pre CR RNA occurs here, and then at the third step, there is a cleavage of guide from RNA to pre CR RNA. Then you have a binding of inactive Cas9 guiding nucleases to RNA to produce the active Cas9. So, this is a very uh, natural step what occurs in the CRISPR. But 
Now this novel methodology where people apply is called as an engineered CRISPR Cas9 technology where the transcription of guide RNA as a single sequence. So all these steps have been regulated to one thing where you have an guide RNA as a single sequence and then the transcription and translation can occur at the guide RNA to Cas9 nucleases and the binding will guide for the activation of the cast. So this is more, engineered system is more uh, uh, advanced where you can regulate at the gene of interest where you want, the site of interest and the uh, position of interest what you, you can regulate and make the application more um, viable when compared to the natural or um, normal um, crisp gas power. So again, where all you apply this technology? For example, again, I have shown here a very simpler example, simple example where this CRISPR cas therapeutic genome editing can help in regulating a hematological disorder. For example, here you have an kind of an patient where you take somatic cells or you take the blood cells and then you reprogram them to an IPSC to make sure that induced pluripotent stem cells and then you apply your gene correction here. For example, when you take these cells, you can make sure that you introduce an addition or a correction or a disruption where you use this CRISPR-Cas9 technology and then from this defective IPSCs, you can make the corrected IPSCs. So when this corrected IPSCs can have a potential for a differentiation into the type of cells. For example, here we are showing you that the corrected IPSCs can be used for a cytic like cells and then endothelial cells or what else. You can make many, for example, in our lab we have made for a retinal pigmental epithelial cells and then we make human Diesel camel stromal lung cells actually because of lung biology and retinal degeneration in our lab. Then you transplant and then uh, you uh, again you do a transplantation of the cells into the animal mice, animal models, mice models or different things to just look at the physiological characters. And if everything works fine and you feel that the uh, the corrections what you have put is falling in the line of what you you your interest falls then this can be taken up to the patient where this automatic def de defective things can be corrected because of this technology. This is a one simpler example I'm showing where you can use this genomic engineering applications for your CRISPR. Same thing, multiple things like for example, uh, drug development, gene surgery, for example, the fields, molasses or any other uh, kinds of uh, biofuels, food, or again looking at the different kind of materials and it can be genetic variants, animal models, all multiple applications can be used with this CRISPR-9 and people based upon their aim and based upon their goals and the questions, people use this methodologies to treat that. So again, as I promised you, I will I'll be having a couple of more minutes, I guess. Uh, just I will take a couple of minutes to close the session. I just said that genotyping to the forensic phenotyping. Here it's a very clear indication if you see that uh, you get a biological sample and then it can be a paternary, maternary dispute or any other time scene where the forensic people, sciences people manipulate this genotype, genotyping and the uh, biology of genetic engineering to make sure the activity is being decoded. For example, here the biological material can be blood, nail, or semen, or any biological sample, sweat, or whatever, based upon the crime of evidence. Then you make sure that you do a uh, uh, gene of interest uh, study, which means uh, uh, you characterize using different methodologies, and then you make sure that the identification can be helping for these investigations. So again, as I said, that the query sequence, control sequence, database, look at the DNA sequencing, use multiple sequencing alignments, 
here uh, use at the recombination level again you have an uh, population genetic uh, parameters or any combinant parameters you simulate this you substitute with the models then you get a phylogenetic network and finally look for the functional analysis so this is a just i'm just giving you a, a brief pipeline showing that how this genetic data can be oriented and then modulated with the model for exercise so the predicted things in the next upcoming thing what they foresight is morphometrics can be very thing by using just a facial recognition again looking at the genetic levels people can uh, really decode which people apply now in during even you go for a check in in us um, other higher laboratories and then color phenotype of a skin hair or iris or look at the microbial forensic sciences Look at the DNA methylation assays or vitisopa, where if you touch, you can know the DNA contents and other things, which can be easily evaluated by using the machine thing. And then look at the next uh, generation serology, because I can use the blood can be in a very important uh, biological material to look. And then, as I said, that make a fluid chips for forensic DNA analysis. So again, last part of uh, my talk today, as I said that uh, though we do all the biology, again, the uh, wet lab needs to be a bigger thing with the dry lab. For example, people use for a uh, genetic tool for bioinformatics, big data and data analysis. For example, you look for uh, uh, using, managing the data management, you manipulate IT information technology and use a big servers and big uh, things big data to uh, decode for molecular biology, genetics, biophysics, everything. So you have a scientific discipline which can be uh, decoding for your gene, DNA, protein, metabolomics, whatnot, with using a support system of bioinformatics. So you look at the gene-gene network analysis, you look at the microbial analysis, or you look at the microarray analysis, you look at the path analysis, you look at the disease network analysis, evolutionary network, sequencing analysis. You have a tool where this helps us to make sure that your time and your effort and the qualitative analysis is being generated by using this. So finally, I would say that you can it can be a very fetchable thing for taking up to train the next level of young minds of the students to say that this exploratory areas can be taken up where the genetics can be studied at the smaller level to the higher level for example the virus the bacteria to the plant to the fly to the fungus to the worms zebra fish mice and of course to the humans so you classify them based upon the population genetics medical genetics and the forensic genetics where you do a different various applications and then look at the big data thing or again as I said the data analysis, clinical genetics, genetic epidemiology, again application of informatics and statistics. The first slide what where I have shown that these are all of the components where you need more to know a little bit statistics, you need to know a little bit computers, you need to know a little bit microbiology, you need to look a little bit more with biochemistry, all these components can be very much helpful in deciding and deciphering the functionalities and finally in making a big revenue. In the sense, as I said, that everything, whatever has to be coming from the bench has to go to the bed in the form of anything. It could be plant, micro, fungi, or anything. So this is what uh, I felt uh, to share to you today with the uh, genetic functionalities to the kind of uh, what can be the major tools, modern tools for manipulating different kinds of things. I thank you everyone for your patient time and for your attention.